So uh, I have been studying deception for a long time. I actually started working on deception when I joined the lab of Judy Burgoon back in the mid 90s. It's hard to believe it's been that long. Uh, and she was working on uh, grants for the US Army at the time. And I went to study with her because I wanted to learn about nonverbal communication. And she was the world famous expert on nonverbal communication. But um, what I've learned over the years is that uh, deception is much more complicated than just analyzing nonverbal cues. So rather than present my research, which I'm sure um, you can Google Scholar me and find as much of it as you like, or as much of it as you can stand, um, instead, I would like to talk a little bit more broadly. I'm very honored to be the first speaker at the first session of this new society. So I thought I would use that um, you know, auspicious role to kind of set the stage for what I think are the challenges that we face as a community. And the three challenges that I'm going to talk about, let me, there we go, are um, the elephant problem, which is the uh, age old issue of people seeing things from their own perspective and not from the perspectives of other people the whack-a-mole problem, which is the fact that we're always trying to um, stay ahead of the liars that we're trying to catch. And then the, pro the other problem is the research practice gap. And I don't know how many practitioners are here, but uh, I have been working a lot with police officers and intelligence community and people um, who can really use this research. And I think that um, that we have a real problem in trying to get our research into the hands of the people who can use it. So I'll start with the elephant problem. Um, we, many scholars in this field have PhDs. And one thing that people with PhDs are very good at is becoming very, very specialized in a particular small area. I told you I went to study with uh, Dr. Burgoon because I was interested in nonverbal cues. But I've since learned that I really need to learn about a lot more than that. I probably should also have a PhD in linguistics and maybe also a PhD in computer science and maybe in machine learning. And I wish that I could replicate myself and get PhDs in all of those things. But what I've tried to do instead of that is collaborate with researchers outside of my discipline because we're used to different methods. We have different terminology. I remember a grant I was writing many years ago with some computer scientists and the grant um, instructions said to identify the theory or model that is guiding your research. And so, you know, we set about dutifully writing up our theoretical lens and we showed it to them and they didn't understand what it meant at all because then in their mind, a model was an algorithm. So they were like, well, where's the algorithm? And, you know, and I was like, I don't know what you mean. So we just really couldn't even collaborate very easily because we didn't even have a common language. But deception is a real interdisciplinary problem. And the problem that we have is that we publish in our own journals and we go to our own conferences and um, we don't talk across disciplines often enough. And so that's why I was very excited to find out that this group of scholars was getting together because I believe that um, it's an opportunity for us to do that. Um, there are, you know, the Decepticon, I've been to the, the two Decepticons that have been held and I think it's, um, they've, they've really emphasized this interdisciplinarily, but we have to do more of that, I think. The second problem is what we call the whack-a-mole problem. I heard Joe Walther, my colleague, use this term. And I know he didn't coin the term, but I thought it was a really good way of kind of describing the problem that we have in deception. Because um, as a community, we're trying to solve the same problem in various contexts, right? We're studying it in law enforcement and in fraud detection and in um, education and in psychology and a lot of different contexts. And um, when we publish our research, it actually becomes accessible to the people that we're actually trying to detect. So as we learn new cues to deception, the bad actors are learning how to beat our tests. And the classic example of this is the polygraph. So uh, the polygraph is still in my mind, one of the best ways to actually catch liars. It's really a very good way at um, capturing um, physiological arousal, not necessarily deception, 
but um, in certain contexts, it can distinguish liars from truth tellers. And um, especially if it's used, you know, in very specific kinds of ways. But if you go to YouTube right now and you Google or you search in YouTube for um, how to beat a polygraph, you will find dozens of videos, thousands of videos to teach people how to beat the polygraph. And I feel like every time we come up with something new, uh, the, you know, the bad actors out there are thinking of ways to try and foil our latest tests. Um, another problem that we have is that humans are terrible lie detectors and no matter how much training we give them, we don't seem to be able to get ahead of the problem. And so the solution I think is to examine multi-modalities. So to not only look at nonverbal cues, but also at the voice and the linguistic cues and the um, content of what they're saying and maybe even some physiological arousal cues in there as well. And to catch liars, humans won't be able to do this without help. That we really need AI, we need machine learning. How you fuse the human decision maker with AI, I think is a problem that has yet to be solved um, because people are very nervous and probably rightly so about turning decision making over to machines. Um, we all start thinking um, Terminator scenarios. Um, but I think that we've demonstrated quite well that humans just can't do this without help. And so how to fuse humans and machine learning um, and um, artificial intelligence all together, I think is going to be the big problem that is looming ahead of us in the future. The final problem that I think we have is that we have a real divide between researchers and practitioners. And while some researchers have been reaching out to practitioners and some practitioners have been trying to learn what they can from the science, I don't think that it is um, common yet for uh, that collaboration to happen. One problem is that up until recently, scholarly research has always been hidden behind paywalls. It's not readable to non-academics like journalists and people that work um, in fields like law enforcement. And it's written in a scientific jargon that they can't necessarily understand. Um, open access journals maybe are change, changing that. Um, some more popular press books have come out that are accessible to the public. And so I think that there is um, potential for that. We also have this kind of, you know, Scientists, I think, don't always value the input of practitioners. Their real world experience is discounted. And then the practitioners are also, you know, they've been trained in a certain method and they're resistant to learning from the scholars, you know, what works and doesn't work in the lab and trying new techniques. I saw this firsthand. I went to the American Polygraph Association meeting a few years ago to try and talk with them about other ways of detecting deception and they're very diehard and you know attached to their polygraph. And so it's difficult to get people to try and think about other things. The other thing is that I feel like as a community, we haven't done a very good job of sending a consistent message about what works and doesn't work to the practitioners. Um, there was a, a talk, what was that just a month ago, Sophie, where um, we, we heard from uh, an important study across deception scholars of what we think are the important cues and we don't even agree amongst ourselves. And we spend a lot of time trying to discredit one another because we wanna be you know, the most important scholar. We wanna be the first to publish things. We want to you know, have other people cite us and recognize our research. And, um, and because I've been in the field a long time, I get asked to review a lot of journals which means I see other people's reviews of the same thing that I'm reviewing. Because when people get a rejection or an r, &R a lot of times you see the other reviews. And man, we are hard on each other. We are really harsh in our reviews sometimes. And I feel like we could be more encouraging and more collaborative in the way that we talk to each other and the way that we evaluate each other's research. That doesn't mean I don't want to be rigorous because you know scholarly science has to involve debate and argument. Maybe I'm just too Canadian that I want everybody to get along. 
but I feel like we need to really try and reach out to one another um, and be more collaborative as a community, which is maybe one of the great things that this new group will promote. The most important thing though, I think is that we have to step up and start talking to the practitioners and doing a better job of that because what has happened is that there are some very slick pseudoscientists out there who have filled the void. Um, Vincent Deneau was uh, a, an important leader on this charge. He authored an article and invited um, 50 other scholars to join in on the article and we've published it in three different languages now. And it talks about three different pseudoscientific claims the um, BAI or the read technique, the SPOT program here in the US and synergology, which is um, most popular in French speaking countries. But these pseudoscientists create these very slick training programs. They um, market what they know to the very people that could use science and um, they have filled, filled that void that we have left behind. And it's very dangerous and we need to do a better job of communicating our scientific findings to the public and to practitioners. And we need to collaborate more with practitioners so that we hear their point of view. Um, so those are the three challenges that I think we have. Um, collaborating amongst ourselves, um, trying to stay ahead of changing technology and also um, reaching out more to practitioners. So I'm curious to see what you all think of these. Of course, we have other challenges as well, but those are the three that I thought um, kind of strike me as the most pressing in our current research environment. I thank you very much for your time.